Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best scale up leaders in the world to help you scale your own business. Today, we have a very special episode uh, and a very special guest. Uh, his name is James Barrett, the regional director at Michael Page. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, let's let's get to know more uh, about yourself and uh, how did you end joining Michael Page and, and what you what are you doing at Michael Page today? Um, so my responsibility at Michael Page is I run the UK digital and technology business. So we're the uh, fastest kind of growing business line, Michael Page in the UK at the moment. It's for the wow. audience that don't know, uh, Page Group have been trading and scaling for about 40 years, uh, world leading recruitment consultancy, started by a couple of accountants back in the late 70s who saw an opportunity and now we've uh, scaled up to about 7,000 people in 36 countries and there are 150 offices and um, yeah, it's been going well. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really amazing and a great summary uh, of, of, of um, your position, your impact and uh, Michael Page. So for our audience, as you know, we cover different stages of growth in the show from 1 million to 100 million, from 100 million to 1P with uh, Quatrix and Box, for instance. And Michael Page is uh, at this stage over 1.5 B uh, pounds. So in the journey from 1 B to 10 B or from 10, 1 B to 1 3, if you want to be aspiring, the, the largest company in the world nowadays is still Walmart with half a trillion um, in, in revenues. So as we always discuss, it gets tougher and tougher as we scale. So in order to, to double or triple the revenue at 1B or 10B, it might be very, very complicated. So what are some of the avenues for growth um, that you consider uh, when trying to expand your, your own practice, your own division and, and the Michael Page um, group? It, it's, a, it's a great question and you're right. It's, it's not easy and it gets harder the, the bigger you get. I mean, Michael Page's <laughs> Uh, ethos um, for the last you know, over 40 years is that we only grow organically. So we have never mm -hmm. acquired another company, um, which is obviously the quickest and often the most painful route um, <laughs> to, 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 to scaling through. So from a, from a page perspective, our strategy is very much looking at high potential growth markets. And increasingly, that's international. So we are, as I say, in 36 countries now, we are going to emerging markets where you know, finding the right talent is not a straightforward process. So we are in the Philippines, we're in Indonesia, we're in, in South America, a lot of these kind of emerging markets and emerging markets for both technology and, and for talent. So that has been our real success story, how we've managed to diversify and, and perform so well you know, throughout challenging markets, the first thing to your portfolio, right? Um, in the UK, which is the most mature and most saturated recruitment market. I think it's um, worth about 39 billion a year. You know, there are tens of thousands of recruitment companies out there. Uh, we took the view about three or four years ago that uh, we needed to uh, move further outside of our, our, our well-known brands, which are around finance, recruiting, accountancy, and sales, and really drive into the technology and digital markets, because clearly, you know, they're scaling and scaling massively as, you know, as, mm -hmm. as you communicate so well on your on your podcast and, and, and Thank for you, us, it, it, it's that balance around being able to work with companies at every stage of growth because it, it, the solution that you need to find for somebody who is at seed stage versus series a b c d it, it's it's massively different and therefore you know, being open understanding what their challenges are and showing that you are a partner that is going to scale with them that, that's the really, really key way of working. And then it's looking at innovative solutions. So corporate innovation, what can you do around the data? I mean, Michael Page hold more data than Netflix, um, I've heard. <laughs> I've heard <laughs> um, you know, it, it's how can you actually use that data to support companies at different stages of growth and innovation. So you become more than just a core offering because the market moves. So using data and technology would be the, uh, the key game changer in that situation. It's a very good point, and I um, also enjoyed the fact that uh, you have never acquired a company, and we all know how um, painful it can be, and how many stories of bad integrations kill amazing businesses when they are integrated into um, 
a large uh, enterprise. So, um, and also the the different leaders that are needed in in each stage uh, of that um, integration or of the growth of the company. So it can be a a difficult cultural mix to um, to digest to both companies. Any experience on 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 that front in terms of integration and uh, finding out leaders who can help transition uh, from more a scale up environment to a corporate or enterprise environment? Absolutely, it, it, it's a real challenge. I think um, if you look at the majority of large mergers and acquisitions, the, the analysis shows that they don't deliver the shareholder return that was promised mm-hmm. you know, to get the investment to secure it um, you know, after mm-hmm. three to three to four years. And as with any transformation, yes, there's process, yes, there's systems, technology, but it's the people element. And, and that is the bit that, that really, really makes a, makes a huge difference. So you know, in terms of being successful and moving through that integration, and we've seen some really big deals recently, and I'm sure with the, uh, you know, with the cost of borrowing money at the moment being so low, we're going to see a lot more. It really is a big decision as to do you integrate the culture or do you leave those as two standalone businesses? And right. that is such a subjective decision based on the organization. But when these mega corporates come in and, and sweep up these aspiring startups, uh, you just fear that they're going to crush the culture and the innovation um, to be able to actually realize that value. So you, if you are going right. to be successful in integrating, you need leaders who have worked in both the big corporate and the startup successfully. Finding those people who have done both and been done both successfully is, is is really tough, and those those people are worth their weight in weight in gold. And we always discuss um, three critical ingredients to to scale in the show. Uh, number one is radical focus. Number two is world class leadership, and number three is culture of execution. Starting with number one and and radical focus, um, sometimes it's counterintuitive, but as we keep growing, there is a a tendency to start to get out of our core and start doing risky bets in what what is not aligned with our strengths. So in a company that is pressured to keep growing and is trying to find uh, ways of, um, of of scaling uh, into another products, geographies, um, and sometimes industries. How how do you assure that the company keeps loyal to the mission, to the values, to the vision, and to the core competences and to the core business? I think I think it's a great question, um, and there's not an easy answer. I, I think <laughs> I, I think. I, I think to be successful, it's around being um, being reflective and really looking back within what is the core of your business and what is your what is your market fit and what are the principles you are building the business on. Because if you can, if you if you are committed to effective principles, um, then you can use that as a platform as, as a foundation to go and bolt on other services, to bolt on different value add you know, products and, and features. But if you don't really take time to step back and understand what that core of your business is, then by definition, your foundation is shaky. And if you're building on a shaky foundation, then you, you will fail. So for me, you know, the, the radical focus needs to be within, it needs to be continuously assessed. You need to be iterative in your approach. We're always coming back to what's the reason for this company to exist? What solution are we, you know, what problem are we solving? And is what we are offering as our next service, does that fit with those? If it doesn't fit with those core principles, I think you're on very shaky ground. That's a very good point. And and keep obsessed about the the pains of the core customers of the business and getting better and better than any fun, any anyone else in the marketplace solving those pains and delivering results to our core customers. And moving forward to the to the number two, world class leadership. Uh, and I think that this is one of the most painful uh, points um, that we discuss in, in, in the show and that you can al- also add a lot of value um, here. We, we tend to discuss that even in, in the earlier stages from 1 to 100, we might need to run seven different businesses with seven different CEOs, seven different leadership teams, and seven different middle management teams, and 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 of course seven different profiles of individual um, contributors. So it is critical to scale a company from five to ten, ten to twenty, twenty to fifty, or fifty to one hundred, to have sometimes different profiles um, 
to to scale the company. So having or having right decisions or making right decisions about having the right people on the right seats is really a critical ingredient to um, to scale. And sometimes CEOs um, tend to understand this a little bit later uh, on on the job. Uh, what, what are some of the um, of the principles or of your advice on helping top leaders really investing time on on hiring, recruiting, and and of course having the best partners to help them. Uh, I think it's a great question, and I think it is a uh, it's a tipping point as to how quickly your business will grow, scale, and and succeed. And ironically, you know, I'm scaling my business um, threefold at the moment, and the biggest challenge, despite wow. being a despite being a recruitment consultant myself, is <laughs> finding people for my own business um, yeah. that are going to fit culturally, that they're going to fit with the team now, and have the headroom to grow for the future. So I think the, the principles when it comes to to hiring at this leadership level is are you hiring for now or are you hiring for the next phase? And therefore, you really need to define what is the outcome you are looking to achieve, what is the business outcome you are looking to achieve, and then working that back through and reverse engineering that into the actual job mix in terms of the skills and the experience that you need in your organization to deliver that outcome, whether that is now or in three months or in three years. Mm -hmm. And once you've really effectively challenged that, within the outcome and what makes it up, then you can go and look for the, for the person that can fill that role. But you've got to accept that that might well be time bound. The, the VP of sales that you bring in when you're going, you know, when you're doubling in size initially, is probably not going to be the VP of sales that you need when you're starting back into wider enterprise accounts. It's not going to be the same VP or growth officer that you need when you're going internationally. And it's really being objective with you know, and time bound with what the outcome is you're looking to achieve. That would be my, my key advice. Because if you hire somebody who is, I guess, too, too, too big, too experienced, too soon, they will get bored and they will struggle to adapt in the hands-on approach and they will, uh, they will probably drown with the amount of things that are in front of them. If you have, hire somebody who is great for now but not for the future, then you're going to have to have a difficult de decision to make in the next you know, number of months or years. So that, that, is the, that is the crux of whether you can hire the right person now or for the future. Absolutely, and you you mentioned one of the most difficult uh, positions to hire in in the industry, the VP of Sales. Do what? What from your experience? What are the most difficult uh, roles um, that usually clients and and yourself have have a challenge with? Um, I, I think the sales one comes up time and time yeah. again with 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 our scaling clients because they usually have an understanding of the technology that they want to build or buy. So they are usually, you know, mm -hmm. in the early stages, comfortable with their tech lead. The chief executive or founder is, is usually you know, filling in all the gaps and they usually have enough marketing resource to be able to take the business on for the, for the next, next half year. But the, mm -hmm. the one that really makes a difference is, is going to be that kind of VP of sales. The next stage when they're looking to rage finance is very much around the CFO and the CFO mm -hmm. that can deal with the investors um, that can essentially go and secure right. the money and partnerships that you require. And when you start getting the investors looking at you know, Series A, Series B, then they're looking at the whole management team. So really then your, your CPO, your CTO, those, you know, are those people going to get the investors excited to get to the next stage? Because they may have been great with the original code um, or with the original product and features, but you know, have they done this before? And if they haven't taken their scale up on the journey before, then that is a risk for investors. And investors don't tend to like too much risk. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's the point when over 80, whenever people having a layer, a very strong layer of middle managers is really, really uh, important. And sometimes we observe that the C, the founder CEO who is um, an entrepreneur uh, who is in the in the phase of trying to find product market fit, who needs to test a lot of different things, and needs to um, to be really entrepreneurial. And when it gets to after product mar market fit, it needs to be much more structured, disciplined, less inventive, and much more execution uh, oriented. And the same happens 
with with the with the first VPs that the that CEO uh, hires. So they also have the same difficulty to start building a team who can deliver results uh, as a team and not by uh, each individual. So this transition in terms of mindset is always very complicated. We also see this covered in a lot of books, uh, the transition from individual contributor to, to manager, from manager to ad, from ad to director, VP and, and CEO. Um, any, any tips about those transitions from, from being an individual contributor to, to leading uh, a team and a team that keeps expanding and having different competences along the scale-up journey? It's 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 a real challenge. I think that if you are going to be successful and you are going to scale at pace, you need to have your both yourself and your your team, your leadership team, playing to their strengths. And if you know, managing and developing people, nurturing careers, because it is a privilege to nurture and develop someone's career. Mm-hmm. Management is one of the few areas where you can do that. If that is not your strong point as a founder, then you need to find somebody who is. And equally, if you, as a founder, you are not very, you, you are not you know, comfortable going out and hiring talent, if you do not have the time to go out and identify that talent, then to onboard it and nurture it, then whether that's hiring someone internally or working with external partners, you, you, need, to, you need to actually you know, invest some time and commit to that. Because it is only when you have failed at managing or you have failed at hiring ex, you know, external talent in that you realize what opportunity you missed. And then that is an opportunity that's missed around productivity, around your brand, around morale in the team. So absolutely playing to your strengths and finding the right people in the right roles. Yeah, incredible. And usually on, in, in the venture back the industry, uh, we, have, we work in 12 to 18 month cycles and need to prove certain milestones to raise the next round or achieve the next milestone. Even if we, when we go to the next league and we, we are listed, uh, we start being measured by quarters and the same milestones needs to be del- delivered um, in, in, to, to the investors out there. So there is a huge um, pressure and there are some cultures who, who believe that we need to be very uh, tough if we feel that we... We, did, we didn't onboard or we didn't recruit the right uh, VP. And there are another cultures who believe that we need to give those people a little bit more time, but it can mean uh, death for a company that is scaling at, at that stage. And at the same time, if, if we are too aggressive, we might, we might also lose um, the culture uh, and the... Um, Having, having the leadership team working really together and trusting uh, each other. So what, what's your experience in terms of managing uh, the, the process of building a high-performing team and at the same time uh, having the courage when we see that it's not the right person to, um, to let that person go and, and bring a new one? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a, it's, it's a real it's a real challenge. I think I take it back to my earlier answer around if you have defined the business outcome that you're looking to achieve and you have really robustly challenged yourself and the rest of the stakeholders in the business of what this VP needs to be doing in their role. And off the back of that, you have set up a very clear onboarding process with targets and success factors. Behaviors are woven into that in terms of what behaviors they need to be able to demonstrate. Then actually, I wouldn't say it, it, it's aggressive you know, firing them if they are not performing on those levels because the culture of the business should be that we want the best, we understand what good looks like, we will support and collaborate and take each other there. But if somebody has been hired into the wrong role, then that should be pretty apparent after a number of months and therefore is in everyone's best interest and for that individual to go and find a role that is more suited to them. So I think if you are scaling quickly and you have done your due diligence internally and externally, then that is actually a, I wouldn't say it's a straightforward process. I wouldn't say it's a painless process, but it's one that is born out of principles and all makes sense to all individuals. If, firstly, you have brought someone into a role that you haven't interviewed fully, you haven't got a clear onboarding plan, that they have a differing view of what success is to you and the other stakeholders, 
then then ultimately that is your responsibility as the founder that is your responsibility as a leadership team and you need to you need to address that and whether that is changing your processes or changing the onboarding for that person you know, that that rests with you amazing um we, we like to say in the show that uh the most important skill when starting up is about sales because you don't have so much to show and there is not a brand behind not a very strong product yet but the most important skill when scaling up is really uh hiring the right people and and leading those those, those people so but recruiting is really the the muscle to develop for for the ones who want to to scale because it's it gets impossible to do everything ourselves and it becomes a job of a, a world-class team so moving to the ingredient number three, uh, culture of execution. So this is all about, uh, um, all related to the boring, mundane work that any scale-up needs to do. Uh, it's not sexy, but that's the, the weeklies, the dailies, the monthlies, the quarterlies, the annuals, the one-on-ones, the tunnels, so communication, communication, repetition, repetition, and repetition. So what are some of yeah. the, the best rhythms uh, that you apply on, on your own business and that you have been seeing your clients applying to assure that we are all on the same page as as we keep scaling yeah absolutely i, I think consistency is is key and, and, I, and i'd answer the question slightly differently and say if, if you are a leader in scaling a business whether that's in a corporate um or an entrepreneurial venture the, the, the main thing that you need to have is is consistency if you have consistency you can be transparent with what you're looking to do and what you're looking to achieve and if you have that underpinning every you know, meeting, every interaction, however you want to set it up that's right for your rate of scale and number of people, then then you will be successful. I think that the challenge comes when you have uh, individuals in your business who have joined on the hope of being able to build something fantastic with you, but they don't know where they stand, that you know, their targets are not clear or their targets change. Inconsistency is, is a real issue because if you have inconsistency in the way that you approach your people who are your most valuable asset, then when things change or work in a different way, it'll be viewed as hypocrisy. And, and that undermines any manager of any size of organization. So I really do think it comes down to having a clear and consistent way of setting expectations, being outcome focused, then supporting and collaborating with your team members and your leaders to make sure you are all aligned to get that to the, you know, to the objective as quickly as possible. Very good. Um points again and reflecting uh, as you as you talk because you, usually it's as we always say when scaling it's it's very easy to complicate things uh, and usually in order to increase speed we need to simplify we need to kill initiatives we need to reduce var variables and um, and we need to do the basic stuff instead of trying to do the the very intelligent uh, stuff of complicating uh, things and this is very counterintuitive and usually uh, we have the, um, the opportunity to work with very intelligent people and uh, and sometimes we know <laughs> that uh, we 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 complicate a little bit uh, more things than than what they need to so we we come to the last segment of the show and uh, one of our favorite uh, questions always which is if you would be joining uh, or meeting James when he was joining uh, Michael Page, what advice would you offer to uh, your own self? Um, again, yeah. again, a good, a good question. Uh, if I was getting in my time machine um, and going back a few years, I think accepting that done is better than perfect. Um, I, I think that when I was trying to, when I set out to start growing this business. I had a, a vision, a very powerful vision to myself around what I wanted the business to look like, um, to be the, you know, to be the best in class. And what I've realized through growing that business and making loads of mistakes you know, along the way has been that you know, making sure that we got some, got the right solution for the customer, got the right solution for the candidates looking for a role, but it's far more important than having a business or a proposition that ticked all the boxes and looked, uh, looked perfect from the outside. I think that would be my, my biggest takeaway and would have made the job far more enjoyable in the early years uh, when we were growing very quickly and didn't really know what we were, you know, what we were doing. Um, and I think off, off the back of that, then it, again, it comes back to, to the hiring piece. You know, hiring is a nonstop process, whether you do it yourself 
uh, whether your team do it, whether you have external partners to do it, is something that you must, must be part of every day. You're always looking at your network, networks of networks, always looking for referrals and references on people so you can find out who the top talent is. And if you make that commitment, and as you said earlier, um, you know, it's the most important muscle, more, most important muscle to flex. If you get that right, then you'll be far more successful. So I wish I had, uh, I had embraced those points a few years ago. I'd probably be, a, probably be a, a, running a bigger business now. That's that's amazing, and definitely I would recommend to to the audience to invest at least one day per week just on nurturing and building your next um, team and preparing. Another day leading your own team. Uh, another day being an ambassador for your external stakeholders. One day communicating to your internal stakeholders and. Let the last day being your be your free time day or your strategy day. So where you think about the business, and of course the two usual days to to rest. James, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for sharing your amazing uh, career with us, and uh, we you are always invited to to come back to let us know how did you get to freebie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. And look, thank you for having me. I really enjoy your, your podcasts. I, I use them with my uh, my team as well so they can understand what's going on in the wider market and how businesses approach these kind of problems. So no, it's a real, real pleasure being here. Thank you. Very kind of you. Thanks again, James. And to our community, thanks for being there. We keep bringing you the best of the best so you can um, leverage their lessons and avoid their mistakes. See you soon and keep scaling. <laughs>